night Kharkiv guys and uh, PM night nights are local product management events where uh, members of the community are invited to share the experience and their knowledge and today's event is hosted by SoftServe and uh, our guest today is Robert Stephenson, a technical product manager at Spotify. So Robert, we're glad to have you here. So the stage is yours. There we go. And I need to take back over the screen sharing now, I suppose. So just let me do that. And OK, there we go. So you should be looking at my slides now. Is that correct? Yeah, I can see your slides. Excellent. All right. Uh, well, welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming. Excited to, uh, to be here to, uh, to talk to you today. Um, as uh, as, as uh, Yaroslav introduced me, my name is Robert Stevenson, and I'm a technical product manager uh, here at Spotify. Um, and before we get into what I do, I'll introduce myself on a bit of a personal level. So I'm originally from Toronto, Canada. I went to the University of Waterloo, uh, where I got a, a degree in computer science, graduating in 2012. Uh, and then after graduation, I moved to Silicon Valley, where I then worked for, for LinkedIn as a distributed systems engineer, building graph databases. Eventually, I got sick of the commute times in the US, among other things and uh, decided that I, since I had always wanted to live and work in Europe, I would start looking for a job overseas. And the, the most exciting job that I found was, was here at Spotify, where I've now been uh, for about four and a half years in Stockholm. And I'll introduce Spotify a little bit. I'll assume most of you are familiar, but for anyone who isn't, we're a music and podcast streaming service with 345 million monthly active users. And I'm currently a technical product manager here at Spotify. But I, uh, when I joined, I joined as an engineer working on distributed systems problems similar to what I was at LinkedIn. And when I joined, the, the product manager of my team was named Johan. And I, I was always very interested and inspired in the way that Johan would work. I liked how he would look holistically at the way that Spotify was leveraging or, or trying to leverage data, think about the different problems we were having in terms of productivity or in terms of uh, what the data quality was holding us back from, and then uh, and then think about the ways that the products we were building within my team or the engineering experience that we had within my team could be leveraged to make really like a step change in terms of how well Spotify was able to leverage its data. So inevitably, when Johan looks at, at such a high level and, and he, he eventually gets pulled away to, uh, to lead solving one of these high level problems for Spotify. And that meant that this product management position that I always thought was so kind of interesting and inspiring was available. Now, I always thought that maybe I would one day want to make the transition from engineering into product management, but since exactly the job that I thought was cool was, was available right away, I decided I would apply for it now. And, uh, and I applied and I got the job. And now I've been a product manager for about two and a half years. And the product that, that I and my team are responsible for is Spotify's data collection platform. So. Uh, we collect data from all the different ways that, that these millions and millions of users interact with Spotify. And that includes the ways that you, that you probably are very familiar with, like listening to music on your Android or iOS or desktop app. It includes the way that you maybe, are, may, maybe you use, maybe you don't, like listening to Spotify on a game console or on a smart speaker, but also the ways that you maybe interact with just once in a while, like doing administrative things, like uh, upgrading your subscription to premium maybe or ways that you as a consumer don't notice at all, like the surfaces that we have for artists and labels. So th those are our customers too, even though they're not consumers. So, uh, so with us with the data collection platform, our customers are not the, the millions and millions of users that use Spotify every day, but are instead other teams and engineers within the company. So we're doing what I would call internal facing product management or what the literature calls platform product management. And, we take this data that, that we're collecting from all these different areas and we use it for a variety of reasons. Uh, and that would be uh, do, giving you the recommendations that, that, you, that you may love when you use Spotify, or we, we collect the data and we use it to pay royalties to artists and labels. We could use it for data-driven product development. And we don't do this ourselves, we collect it and we, get, we also have these customers on the data side that would use it. So data engineering teams within the company. Now, to contrast, internal facing product management with consumer facing product management. I believe that the fundamentals are really the same, but there are some key differences that I'll point out. 
And to do that with an example, if you imagine as a product manager working on the playlist feature for Spotify, which is one of the most important, uh, most uh, uh, the, the ways that people most like to use the, the app, um, if we were to roll out some, if I'm working on this feature and we were to roll out some change, we'd be able to get most, if not all of the 345 million users to, uh, to try it out. And we'd be able to gather some very interesting quantitative insights for how it's moving some metrics. And then maybe we would want to split these, uh, uh, these, these quantitative insights in different dimensions, like how users in Brazil are using playlists versus in the US versus in Sweden. Now, on the other side, with the data collection platform as an example, we're never gonna have millions of users. We're gonna have dozens, between dozens and hundreds of users, depending on how you count. Uh, and that's because we could have dozens of teams versus hundreds of engineers that need to interact with our platform. So the sample size is just never gonna be large enough to leverage, to leverage quantitative insights so heavily. We're always gonna need to augment them with some sort of qualitative information too. So, uh, it, so it's always this quantitative and qualitative mix and this becomes especially important when you split on dim different dimensions, like uh, in our case, splitting on how the mobile community leverages the data pl collection platform versus the data community reading the data that we produce, or a dimension that I find particularly interesting with internal products, how, how long the tenure, of the, user, the tenure of the user in the company. If you've been working at Spotify for say five years, you're probably pretty familiar with the different hoops you need to jump through or the intricacies and difficulties with some internal tools or if you just joined last month, this is gonna be a very different experience for you. So while I think that these are all really interesting, important differences to keep, to keep in mind, I would argue that the biggest difference is choices. So back to the playlist feature, a consumer facing feature. If, if you as a user don't enjoy using the playlist feature and that makes you not really enjoy using Spotify, you have choices. You're more than welcome to use one of our competitors to listen to music. And I definitely don't believe that this is the case, that people wouldn't enjoy using playlists, but, but yeah, that, that's, that's a possibility. Uh, and this is because users will decide if a, if a product is worthwhile by explicitly uh, paying for it, either with their time or their money. And in the case of Spotify, that means that in, with Spotify's free version, you're engaging with and continuing to listen to music, or uh, with premium, you're, you're paying us with a subscription on a monthly basis. With an internal facing product, uh, the choices are restricted. Uh, and that's because it, it could be, and, and, and very likely is, uh, a high level, like there could be a high level reason why we want to have the data that we collect in, be done in a uniform way through, through a single platform. Because you can imagine if every single feature team out there is, uh, who, who, who's writing a feature in the Spotify app is collecting, instrumenting their code and collecting their data in a different way, this could me make it incredibly difficult to look at the to look at that data uh, from a global perspective to understand what's actually going on in the app, because users might decide that one way we collect data with Protobuf and another way we might collect data in, in Avro format or or maybe a third in Parquet. So you got to resolve that. But maybe more difficult, uh, what, what would be more difficult would be the the semantics of the data. What does the data mean? Maybe some users don't collect data in a similar in a similar fashion. So there, there's gaps if you try to stitch the stitch things together. Um, it actually happened when we when we analyzed the different ways people were collecting data that the, that the the follow button was instrumented in something like thirty different ways. So you can imagine as a data scientist how painful it would be to try to understand what's leading to people following artists when they need to look at the the thirty different types of ways that people are collecting that. So long story short, with internal facing product uh, products, a user's choices are restricted because it could be a net negative if they go and, and they do it on their own. And you might think that this makes the job of a product manager easy because we build something and then we like the whole company just needs to use it. And I would say it doesn't make it easy, but it does definitely change the game. And that brings me to the topic of this talk, which is building a product that the whole company must adopt. And now to understand how this might happen, I'll first talk about a prioritization mechanism that we have at Spotify called company bets. And what these are, is that our, our CEO, Daniel, will get together with the other uh, C-level executives and listen to pitches from, sometimes from, from product managers like myself and like Johan, sometimes they'll listen to pitches from different leaders from different parts of the org, like, like from, from content parts or from um, markets and, and things like this. And we'll figure out what are the top 10 most important projects for the company to be working on. Sometimes the list can be less than 10. 
But because these are coming from all the different ways that, that Spotify is trying to succeed, to compare these and prioritize them can be very much like comparing apples and oranges. If you imagine how difficult it might be to compare a product initiative like getting into podcasts versus a uh, launching in a new market like launching in India versus a, a technical objective like uh, migrating our entire tech stack to GCP or to Google, Google Cloud, which we did recently. So Daniel and the, and the other executives, they, they get together and they agree on what's most important. And then we get a very clear set of, set of top level priorities that we can then autonomously al align around uh, down at my level with the, working within R&D. So in my four and a half years at Spotify, I've actually been a part of five company bets. Uh, uh, most recently one where I was responsible for, uh, for, for the, the, the whole process from uh, building a product, which we needed to then uh, pitch why we were doing this and do the user research and the discovery to actually building it, rolling it out, and then getting the entire company to use it. So throughout this, I formed some opinions on things that work. I've learned the hard way things that don't, and I put together a strategy to use to lead and, exec and, and execute this project, as well as anything I might need to be involved in in the future. And a key theme in that is that we're all in this together. We may come from different departments where we have different local priorities, but we all win if, if Spotify wins or if, if our company wins. And that's because it's, it's been well established that using our product is one of the most important things that the company can do to get the whole company to use our product. So we should be able, like, if everyone is bought into that, then we should be able to align on using the product, which means that because we're all in this together, it's going gonna, it's gonna to work. So today I'll present a framework which I use to give structure and I break it into three distinctly different parts. That's because I've realized that each different part of this process requires a drastically different approach and different skills. And for any of you who are product managers in the audience, you're probably familiar that a product manager quite often needs to do just whatever it takes in order to have the impact. And that's what I realized here, but this gives it some structure. And the dragon's gonna make sense as I go. So on to the first section. This is where we tackle the head of the dragon and we, we do our user research and we build the first version of the product, um, getting some early and impactful use cases into production. We want to achieve product market fit within the, the, the universe of use cases that we need to support. So the different use cases for, in, with the example, I'll stick with collecting data within Spotify um, and, uh, and then validate that this is a good way forward. So starting with the user research, who are our users? And I like to think of this as a good model when doing, uh, when doing user segmentation for internal use cases. And that is that we wanna to try to make the common case elegant and the uncommon case good enough. Now to break that down, I'm saying that there really are two types of users for internal products. Firstly, the golden path users or the common case. And these are the users where the technical stack is, is really as we expect. They, as we say, follow the golden path. And this sounds like a nice metaphor, but it's actually something that we literally have at Spotify. We have these step-by-step -step instructions for new, new engineers who join to, uh, to get spun up and align around a specific technical stack for them to do the, the job that they're hired to do. So that could, for, for, with the example of a mobile engineer, they would follow the golden path and that would help them set up with the, uh, the IDE that they'll be doing development with, with the, uh, the, the test frameworks that they, that they should be trying to use that we, that we typically leverage across the company with the CICD tools, with the release process and so on. So we have one of these for mobile. We have a golden path for backend development. We have a golden path for data engineering. We have a golden path for machine learning and probably some others that I'm forgetting. So in our case with the data collection platform, our golden path users are Android and iOS mobile developers and as well as data engineers who typically leverage BigQuery to, to get what they need out of the data. So if what we build was to, uh, was to cater to just the golden path users, we would make maybe 90% of R&D really happy. But the other 10%, they're stuck. And these are what I would call the side street users. And they're gonna be heterogeneous in nature because sort of by, by definition, they don't follow the golden path. And it could be that they don't follow it because the, the stack that they're working on, it, it just doesn't apply. Like, for example, uh, we have a golden path for Android and iOS, but if you're building Spotify for the smart speaker, it, it just doesn't apply. It could be because the, the use case that they're supporting is 
is quite old. Maybe the system that they're working on it is legacy. Like we're for backend engineering, we're, we're a Java shop, but we do have some old systems that are in Python that are still very, exp uh, very, um, like very important. Or it could be that they don't really necessarily have a good reason, but for some reason they're using a different stack anyways. And if the use case is important enough, we still need to support them. Because like I alluded to at the beginning, we, we can't neglect these side street users. Because if it doesn't work, if what we build they, doesn't work for their, for their particular intricacy, they do have a choice. They are engineers and they're gonna figure out a way to instrument their code and to collect data. And I mentioned the data quality reason why this could be a net negative on, on the company. But if you can also imagine uh, when we tried to move, when we moved our entire tech stack from our on-premise data centers to uh, to Google Cloud, um, this happened that we needed to build a new data collection platform that was that was in the cloud, and if we didn't support the side street users and they all had to fend for themselves, you can imagine how much that would slow, have slowed the process to being able to move uh, their tech stacks into the cloud and then eventually being able to shut down those data centers. So we want to support the golden path users. We want to support the side street users. The next step we're going to do is try to find some early adopters. And to contrast this with how we would do it for consumer product development, at this point, we'd probably have done our research and we formed some assumptions. Then we're going to build a prototype of the a prototype version of the product, which will get in front of some alpha users and see how they use it to validate or invalidate our hypotheses. Um, but with an internal facing product, this approach is, on a, is inefficient. And that's because we don't need to wait until we have the prototype built in order to get some alpha users to, uh, to try it out. We can, we can involve our alpha users from the very beginning because they're, other, they're also, like they're my colleagues, they're employees at Spotify. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna build a virtual team, which includes myself, includes members from the engineering teams that I work with, and includes members of these alpha users that I want to, to work with at the very beginning. And it's important that when we form this virtual team, we get a diverse representation of users who follow the golden path, as well as users who represent the side street use cases, such that what we build will work for, will hopefully work for, for as many, as much of the population we need to support as possible. And in this virtual team, we're going to set a shared goal, which we all agree on is a good first step towards the eventual goal of solving this high level company problem and helping, helping the company win. And then we're going to build the product together. And I'll reiterate that I really think the shared goal here is the key, because in this virtual team with people coming from different parts of the organization, we're all used to focusing on different local priorities. And we want to take off those different hats from, from our own organizations, put on the Spotify hat, and make sure that we're focusing on what we all believe is the best way to help Spotify win. So. At this point, we've built a formed a virtual team which had a diverse, uh, where, where the members represented uh, a diverse representation of use cases, some from the golden path, some from different side street users. We all put on the Spotify hat and we set a shared goal. Uh, and then we built the first version of the product together. Then, because the users that we wanted to get to use the product at the very beginning, these alpha users, because they were actually members of our team to begin with, it's a very natural next step to get those use cases straight into production. So we can say that we've now, now we've been able to reach this product market fit within, within Spotify, and we've been able to have our initial impact. On to the next step. So this would be where we tackle the body of the dragon, trying to scale up our adoption and impact, and then it, as well as achieving, uh, and eventually trying to achieve a critical mass. So it's time to put on our marketing hat. And just because it's high priority to adopt our product, it doesn't directly translate to making that adoption happen. And this might sound intuitive as I say it, but it definitely isn't when you're in the middle of it, that we understand why our product is solving this high level company problem really well. I, I did the discovery myself, the teams have been working on it and they're all bought into this, but so, so we get it. But that doesn't mean that the rest of the company does, especially in a company as large as Spotify. And I found that there are really two reasons why adoptions won't happen. It could be that the leadership are not bought in or that the engineers really don't want to and are dragging their feet. But we're all in this together. It's pretty well established that, at least in my eyes at this point, that the best bet for the company is to adopt our product. But I don't want to mandate that they do. I instead want to make them believe that this is the case to understand what, what I see and, and what the person who's funding this project, what Daniel and the company bet, 
the, the people who agree on the company bets see in it as well. So we're gonna market the product. We're gonna market tactically and we're gonna market not just to leadership, but also to engineers. Now, to explain how I would do this, I'll first point out that with leaders, uh, and you're gonna have many leaders that do come from technical backgrounds, so you can leverage those details, but you probably also have leaders who come from less technical backgrounds, like in our case, leaders that come from content backgrounds or come from maybe business backgrounds. So uh, we need to try to keep the, 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 the sales pitch that we give to the leaders uh, more on a high level. We wanna be able to talk about how the high level company metrics that, that are well-established and maybe even re reported externally are going to improve by the, by the very broad adoption of our product. If we have those metrics and, and we are able to make that link to moving to improving those metrics, and we can explain the link between using our product and solving this high level company problem, we should be able to get the leaders to be bought in and then they will be able to turn around and sell to their organizations as well why this is important. So you start to achieve this, what I'll call a, a trickle down buy-in. But I'm not done there. I also want to market it to the engineers. And I can do this in a totally different way than how I would market to the leaders. Because, well, of course, the engineers are very excited to see high-level metrics do well, which means the company is doing well. There might be lower-level metrics that, uh, that are even more motivational for them. And by that, I mean, if you have a, if you have a metric that, um, yeah, if, if you can help the engineer see the, the direct impact of their work, like a low-level metric that adopting our product will move, then this is gold because they'll be able to see the, uh, exactly why what they're doing is impactful. And while I think this is really useful, uh, but by far what I find is most effective in order to get engineers bought into using our product is just if the product simply makes their life better. So the old way that people collected data before the, this new data collection platform that, that I'm using as the example, uh, if this took say like several days in order for them to go through the workflow that we call instrumentation to, to actually learning something from the data that's produced or instrumentation insights, then this is gonna be some friction and some, uh, some difficulty in their job that, that they maybe are not happy about, or maybe it's so difficult that they just choose not to do it. But if the, the new platform and the tooling around that makes it so they can do it very easily, let's say in order of an hour or something like that, then this part of their job, which is a pretty well-established baseline of, of engineering, like, like doing, like instrumenting your code and understanding what's happening, that becomes so much easier that they can, that they don't even need to think about it and they can just do it. They're going to be very happy. And once they are excited about this way that their lives are getting better or that, that their job is getting easier, they're going to talk about it with their, with their friends and with other engineers. And you start to get this kind of viral bottom-up buy-in. Combining these two types of buy-in from leaders and engineers, I find to be very powerful. So at this point, we've built the initial version of our product with the virtual team and got like the, our initial use cases into production. Then we marketed why it's important to leaders and engineers. People are going to start using it a lot. And this is a good opportunity to start building a rapport with the different influencers in the organization and start and to foster these relationships. So we really want to make sure that the experience of adopting our product is good. We need to know, uh, we, and that means that we need to be listening and ready to help. Specifically in customer support channels like, like Slack, like answer questions on Slack or emails. Um, if there's bugs that prevent adoption, we want to be able to fix them as soon as possible. If there's feature requests that could block the ado their adoption, we want to make sure we can fix them as soon as possible. And even if there's feature requests that are just nice to have, they, we, we need them to know that we're listening and we're going to be able to put them on a roadmap that, that hopefully is visible to them. So, so that way they are encouraged to continue doing that. And obviously if adoption goes smoothly, this is going to make the end, pro the end of the project go faster. But it's also useful for the next project because uh, the, the experience that these different influencers and, and leaders have by, uh, by selling their own organizations to, to use our product will be a good one. So we'll be able to leverage those relationships even better in the future. So we marketed the, we, we built the initial version of the product, got into production, marketed it separately, scaled up the adoption, users are loving it, and they're incredibly thankful to our team for all the great support we're providing. We're basically done, right? Well, now it's step three. This is where we tackle the long tail of the dragon, going from almost done to done. 
And at this point, it is well established. Everyone should understand why using our product is the, probably the highest priority thing they can work on. So why are some teams not doing it? Well, it's time to switch the marketing hat now for project management hat. We're going to break down everybody who's remaining, who should be, who isn't using the product yet, but should be, and meticulously track that they do. And interesting to note that the impact we'll have now is different now. We'll probably still have incremental impact with every additional use case that gets onto the new product, but where we'll have the, the most impact is actually getting, finishing that long tail and getting to 100%, because maybe that means we can throw away some old legacy, maybe with, yeah, some old, old legacy problematic tech that we want to. This is the boring stuff. This is spreadsheets and emails. And it is boring and I don't like it very much, but I find it incredibly effective. So what I'm gonna do here, or what I'm gonna start with here is to map out all the users and reach out and try to understand why it is that they haven't adopted yet. And I found that there, there really are two good reasons why they're not using it. Firstly, maybe they want to, but it's just not supported yet. They might've even tried and they couldn't do it. Another good reason, they, they, they understand why it's important, but if we're company bet number five, maybe they're working on company bet number one. So they just don't have time. And then there's the less good reasons. Like maybe they, they missed the communication where this is something that they need to do or, they, uh, or, or they're dragging their feet. In which case we can ask again. And if there's more pushback, we can, we can escalate if we have to. We do have that. We do have the ability to, to mandate and, and, and make this happen if we need to. But we got to solve the good reasons. And, and that starts with the unsupported. So we're going to try to support the unsupported. And these are very likely the side street users because those are the ones with the more diverse tech stacks that we, that we try to support. Um, and remember, we don't want to leave them to try to figure it out on their own. We're going to try to do it together. And a good thing to realize is that there's probably some overlap in, these in, in the remaining unsupported use cases. So by reaching out at the beginning and understanding what, what these user use cases are, we can then plan, um, we, we can then plan supporting them and probably we can kill two birds with one stone um, by, by dealing with the different reasons they're not supported in, in chunks. So the way that we're going to do this is very similar to how we started the project, actually. And we're going to kind of form a mini virtual team with our team and their team to try to build the support. So that way, everyone gets on the same page. And the effort required for, for my team is, is less than just us building that support. Now, the other good reason, they can't do it for prioritization reasons we're basically going to do it for them, but in the most responsible way possible. And that we're not going to be able to get the effort down to zero. We're going to need them to spend some time knowledge sharing with us, getting our team up to speed so that we can, we can do the adoption for them. And they're going to need to spend some time with code reviews and things like this. But, uh, but we should be able to reduce it significantly. And remember, they, they probably understand why this is important, and they wish that they could actually, actually did have the time to do this. So uh, they'll probably be very thankful that we're willing to go this extra mile in order to kind of take the pain of this adoption. Uh, and I haven't experienced pushback when we ask for knowledge, things like knowledge sharing code reviews, as an example. And it might not be so familiar to you how this could be possible. Like, how do you just do something in somebody else's product? But because we have all of our code, at least at Spotify, in internal GitHub, and we have this, I'll call it an internal open source model, teams are making PRs to other teams code bases all the time. They're encouraged to do this if they think there's an easy feature request that they can just, they, they can just add to. So this is something that people are already pretty familiar with. So now that we've figured out how we're gonna solve the, the good reasons for not using it, we can construct the timeline to actually finish in the project. And that's because our team needs to be involved in basically everything that's remaining. So we do some hand wavy estimations, thinking about how long it'll take to support the remaining use cases thinking about how long it'll take to, uh, to do the adoption for the teams that are, are busy with higher priority projects. We had a bit of a buffer. And now we have a date that we can communicate to stakeholders when we actually believe we're gonna be done. And then we're gonna send out the boring emails to everybody. Uh, and this is where we're gonna contact all the teams, everyone that we need to work with either for the good reasons or for the bad reasons and ask them to, uh, to, to do the work and to adopt, the, um, adopt our product by the timeline that we set. So we're gonna ask for explicit commitment that they can do this. And then most importantly, we're gonna follow up on a regular basis until it's actually done. So I'll illustrate why this is so important and maybe it's intuitive, but 
because if we're asking a team to do something which it, and they have five or six months in order to do it, it's very easy to say, okay, yeah, no problem, we'll definitely get to that. And then all of a sudden, right before the deadline, oh crap, we forgot. Sorry, it's going to be another month. So what I do is I literally will email them every maybe three, three weeks or a month and just say, hey, you said you would do this by the end of Q3. Does it still look like it's possible? Nine times out of 10, I get a response being like, yeah, we have lots of time. Don't worry, it's going to be fine. Sometimes I get a response saying, oh, you're right. Sorry, we forgot. Thanks for, thanks for uh, reaching out. So I can't emphasize enough how important it is to over-communicate in this, uh, when asking for commitment as, as, a, as opposed to under-communicating. And that turns our boring spreadsheets into something slightly less boring where we start to see the remaining use cases falling into place. And if for some reason, maybe there's something we didn't understand or something takes longer than we expected, we start to be able to see where, uh, because we're following up, we start to be able to see where we might have some delay, at which point we can, we can escalate, we can try to ask for help for that team in order to be able to uh, complete what they, what they need, or we can reset expectations with the stakeholders that there's gonna be some delay because this, team, this team's use case is more complex than we thought. And then once again, we continue to follow up until everything is done. And then we're done, right? So in summary, the framework that I use in order to execute these projects where we need to build a product and get the whole company to use it, we start by, uh, by building it together in a virtual team where our, our early adopters are part of that team. Uh, and by early adopters here, I mean users who, rec who represent both the Golden Path users as well, uh, use cases as well as the side street use cases. And that's because we want to make the common case elegant and the uncommon case good enough. Then rather than mandating that the rest of the company uses it, we're instead going to market and try to make everyone understand why this is such an important thing for the company. And we're not only going to market to the leaders, we're also going to market to the engineers, try to get both that trickle down and, and viral buy-in. Then for everyone who's remaining, we're going to uh, meticulously track the adoption and make sure that we do get eventually to that 100%. And we do that by asking for explicit commitment and then following up until that adoption happens. And then, we're, and then we celebrate. Now we're done. And this might sound tongue in cheek, but it's not a joke. We just did something huge. It was well established as one of the most impactful things we could do for our company. And we did it in a collaborative fashion, not only with my team working on it and, and with the virtual team, but also needing to get hard work from so many other stakeholders and, and customers across the company. Um, and and this, is, this is of course nice. Everyone likes a party and it's good for morale. But as a product manager, it's also tactical because I want to be able to, I'm, I'm probably going to want to be able to collaborate with these, these uh, the people that I've worked with again in the future. So this is going to be something that I, where I hope I can, I can form stronger and stronger relationships with them. And now we're done for real. Thank you. Questions? Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, uh, uh. I've heard a lot of insights, especially around boring emails and boring spreadsheets. They're not that boring. Uh, guys, please don't hesitate to put your questions in the chat. Um, do we have some questions that we collected during registration? And um, uh, yeah, uh, re regarding your current slide, uh, what would you like to know about product management two years ago that you already know now? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, that's a very good question. So two years ago, I had been a product manager for maybe six months. And what you see as an engineer working with your product manager, you see only really half of the job. You sort of understand that there's, um, that they need to do a lot of work with, uh, with discovery and that they, like they, they have their own boss and leadership that they're accountable to. But actually working with the team and, and making sure that the team that the running the sprints within the team is, is probably like the least important part of the job. That's something that now I've realized I can, especially with the senior group of engineers, like I can really lean on them and trust them that they can, that they can kind of make that happen. And as long as I've set the direction in a way that, uh, that they believe in, and I've spent enough time uh, probably in writing, getting them to, to buy into that, then that's just going to run itself. And then I can find time to, to spend more time on product discovery and working with customers and understanding what these problems are. And that's something that I, I definitely didn't realize at the beginning. Thank you. And we have a question from uh, Maria. 
uh, actually two questions. Uh, do you have some kind of adoption KPIs for using your product, which impacts salary or some other things on uh, of products users? And the second one, uh, what are the metrics of success for you and your team? Yeah, good question. So uh, adoption KPIs. I mean, we do have KPIs. It's like we we understand the like the total population of of use cases that we need to use the product, and we we track that and make sure that we're. Um, like with a good enough understanding of what those use cases are, we understand where we should be each, uh, as, as we progress. Uh, they don't affect people's salaries though, excuse me. But um, if I'm tasked with getting the whole company to use our product and, um, and, and we're stuck at a very low amount, then, then that would affect, like that would reflect how well a job I am doing as a product manager though. But it's hard to say exactly how it affects salaries. Uh, the second part of the question was, uh, can you remind me please? What are the metrics of success for you and your team? Right. So it's that's a really good question because when when we're building products for internal teams, uh, it's it's often quite far removed from being able to get those quantitative metrics, like I'm saying. So we're we're always looking for how we can scrape the scrape the internal data that we do have to try to figure out if we're moving in the right direction. So um, the thing that I would love if we could measure in a good way is productivity. Measuring productivity is notoriously hard. Like I want to know how productive the data community at Spotify is working with data because that's like what we're directly impacting. So we we try to construct some proxy metrics for productivity. And um, this, like it's, well, we, we typically do this through surveys, but uh, the way that we've done this that is that works particularly well is instead of every product manager sending out their own survey, we have a, uh, an engineering survey, which gets sent out on a regular cadence. And, um, and this, because this is like the one survey to rule them all, we are able to get a really good amount of, um, of answering on it. So if I make sure that the questions that affect data productivity are in there and we get almost everyone who needs to answer the survey, then I do get some pretty good quantitative insights out of it. Um, but if, if you have other ideas for how we can track things like productivity, I would love to love to hear it because it's notoriously difficult. Uh, yeah, guys, if, if you have any ideas, how do you track uh, productivity, feel free to share your ideas in the chat. Uh, thank you very much for your answer. And um, uh, one more question. We, we really have a lot of questions regarding communication because uh, uh, communication uh, across uh, multiple teams because it's really pain in the neck uh, today. So does your technical team has syncops or any other relationship with end user, uh, end user feature teams? So uh, I'm assuming this is consumer fa facing uh, features. Teams. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, can you describe this process in a few words? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, our, our customers are primarily these end user feature teams, at least on the mobile side. Um, or on the data side, it might be the machine learning teams who are feeding data back into those end user feature teams. So maybe it's two step rem steps removed. And uh, well, I will spend a lot of time trying to understand what the problems are that those teams are focusing on. So that way we can try to align our goals. Uh, as soon as it comes down to actually building, um, actually building the solutions, which will try to, to solve our problems or, or what we agree on together are the sort of shared goals that's going to be primarily driven from the engineers. So um, in, in the land before COVID, that meant that we, we would actually, like if we're in different offices, we might go and we, we might go spend a week in their office where we could, um, where we could physically sit together and, and learn from each other. Now it's a, it's a little bit more difficult to do stuff like that. So, so it's a lot of Zoom calls and things like this, but um, it's, it's an incredibly important part of the job. Uh, we're always building things for other teams and it's a, a trap that we need to try to avoid where we build something, get someone trying to use it, and, that, and then just back off. So I, I yeah, I, I, I'm always encouraging engineers to, uh, to be working more and more with directly with the customers, both to try to get them to, to use it and hear feedback, but also to try to make sure that they're um, building the right thing. I'm not sure if that answered the question, but uh, yeah, it's a very important piece. Yeah, um, Larissa, uh, did Robert answer your question? One more question uh, in the chat from uh, Artur. 
what's the difference between technical and reg regular product manager in Spotify? Yeah, that's a good question. I call myself a technical product manager because if I call myself a just a product manager, then it comes with a lot of expectations that I that I am working more on the business side and uh, and and working with directly with consumers, which I'm definitely not. Um, but at Spotify, I would actually just be called a product manager, and there is no distinction. So, um, yeah, maybe, maybe that's not exactly answering the question at all. But but I yeah, within Spotify, you could get hired as a product manager and work doing internal facing product management, which could be super technical, or doing consumer facing product management, which could be very much focused on on driving premium subscriptions, say, which is more businessy. So there's not there's not much of a difference under the surface. Yeah, it's more dependent on your background, right? Exactly. Where you yeah. fits the best. Yeah. So in in our department, which is called data and insights, uh, it's very very common that the product managers are converted from being en either engineers or data scientists. And and we would all probably call ourselves technical product manager managers uh, externally. Um, we have a question from uh, uh, registration. It's not actually a question. It's just three words, sustainable product development. Mm -hmm. uh, but maybe you can share your thoughts, what it looks like from your perspective. Yeah, good question. And uh, I'll assume by sustainable, you mean avoiding working, like avoiding burnout. Um, but I'm not, but maybe you could clarify if you happen to know or whoever asked the questions here. Yeah, if you have if we have an author of the question, so please raise your hand and speak out loud. Otherwise, I'm going to talk about how to avoid burnout. <laughs> yeah, it's a good one. Yeah, but I mean, I can I can answer at least the way that I perceive that question. Um, I think actually at at the product management festival, I got a particularly interesting insight. This was a couple of years ago, and that is that we should never really have enough time as a product manager. Because if, if we do, then it probably means that the problems we're trying to, to solve are, like some of them are probably not that important. So it should always feel like we have too many important products that we can add, or important problems that we are responsible for trying to help solve than is possible because it forces us to prioritize. And I don't know if this is done intentionally or not, but it definitely always feels this way. And that emphasizes how important it is to, uh, to be to be picky about where, where I spend my time, which problems I do focus on, and to say no to some problems which, based on the, uh, the data that I have or the research that I've done, I don't believe to be as important as, uh, as others. So I would say that's really like thing number one is, is just get being, like, being ready to say no to a lot of things which seem very important to some people, but when I stack rank them against the other things that I'm working on are, um, are, are just not as important. The other thing that I would say, which is kind of separate, is making sure that you have time to, um, to kind of reflect and be intentional or proactive in the way that you're working, um, because it's very easy, especially when you have more products to or more problems to solve than uh, you have time for, to be to just be reactive and always be doing the thing which is most top of mind, which maybe you can make incremental progress on fastest. But if you're able to do a small amount of kind of daily reflection at the beginning of the day, maybe, and think what is best for me to focus on today. And then similarly, I like to spend time at the end of the week to think like, okay, did I do what was best this week? What does next week look like? Like, what should I be trying to achieve next week? Then that can really help me avoiding like being into this reactive state and, uh, and making sure that I'm focusing on where I can add the most value. Um, yeah, that, that was a really useful lesson to me and, and it's definitely helped me have more and more impact as I've, as I've grown doing this. Yeah, I agree. Today, focus is probably the most uh, valuable resource that we have. Yeah. And we have to use it consciously. Uh, we have one more question in the chat that I don't uh, fully understand. So yeah, uh, if uh, you'd like to add some more details to your question, please feel free to raise your hand and speak out loud. So uh, it's a question regarding uh, the slide where hiring, uh, are you looking for individual application for hiring or is that an option to make collaboration? Yeah, uh, we're looking for individual product managers who are interested in working at Spotify. Uh, unfortunately, 
maybe that if there is collaboration opportunities with Spotify, I don't know about it. So uh, sorry, I can't speak to that. But no, we are hiring product managers. Uh, yeah, and remote, it's, it's, they're all remote eligible now because you might have heard that we're now work from anywhere. So uh, you, you probably wouldn't even need to relocate to Stockholm or, or to New York, um, but you would have that option. So uh, if anybody is interested in working for Spotify, do reach out and we are uh, we're hiring. Uh, maybe you could share uh, a few a few words, few features of the person you're looking for to join. Yeah, um, it's kind of difficult for me to say because we're hiring several different roles, and but uh, but in general, like we uh, we're growing, still growing quite fast. So um, uh, we're probably looking for people who are interested in working in uh, like as a platform product manager, where like it would be valuable to have a technical background, but but with the, but but with experience uh, doing product, uh, we would also be doing be hiring positions where you would be trying to drive things like engagement or, uh, or or subscriptions by improving the app. We would be hiring for um, uh, product managers to improve how we use machine learning within the product. So, um, if you have experience in those domains and also as a product as a like doing direct product management where you are used to setting visions and, and building strategies and, and things like this, then, then we're definitely interested. Cool. My, your Spotify is industry, industry leader. So I'm sure a lot of people would like to work at Spotify one day. Um, okay, uh, one more question. How do you consider overall enterprise architecture when building a new corporate product? Yeah, and I guess by overall enterprise architecture, I'll assume that this means like the the tech stack of the whole company, uh, and and the different sort of technical improvements that they are trying to make across R and D. Uh, and I would say this is like pretty much the job uh, of a platform product manager, because while I'm directly responsible for for or my team is directly responsible for for if, like making this data collection platform the the engineers and the engineering like leads from the different parts of the company are responsible for making sure that their tech can help drive the business forward so um, if that means that they are not able to get good product insights in a particular way that people interact with spotify because the data collection doesn't work very well then i need to be there and uh, i need to be listening and understand how we can improve that but that would be uh, adapting to a, a problem which is maybe like the easier part but the more maybe like interesting part is understanding what the tech strategy is that that we're trying to take within the company and how that is supposed to provide an opportunity and making sure that the platform is not necessarily all built and ready to support that but that we can um if if that appears to be a good way and that that is an opportunity that we might try to leverage as a company that we are we the, it's a natural extension for us to then go and support that and i say i don't want us to be ready to support everything at the very beginning that would be great but that would be a lot of sort of sunk cost for these different opportunities that end up not being as worthwhile as as we think so um yeah it's a it's a really interesting part of the job to try to understand the the total architecture in, in particular like how we leverage data as a company and then make sure that our our platform is like the data platform is ready to make that as easy as possible. Yeah, and it always you have to keep in mind to, uh, where you'd like to go in a few years since today, yeah, or even if in five years. Yeah, exactly. And I, I might say that the my, my product strategy and the tech strategy of the company should be very, very close to each other. Uh, the things that I think are important for using data should be input to how they set the tech strategy and the tech strategy should inform me what I should be putting into the product strategy so we can have the most impact. So they, they, they have to they, they have to feed off of each other. Yeah, that's that's true. Guys, do you have any other questions? And I'm still uh, moving down the list uh, of the questions we collected. Uh, yeah, uh, so you mentioned in, in your presentation, um, like you uh, gathered the virtual team where you had uh, members uh, 
um, users of the golden path, yes, and uh, some uh, secondary use cases, I, I would say. And uh, in my experience, you know, uh, it's uh, often difficult when people have their primary jobs and they not always want to dedicate their time to the requirements, yeah, and to even prototype investing, that kind of stuff. So how did you manage that workload? Uh, how did you communicate it, the need of involvement of that people? Yeah, so do you mean uh, like with the people that I get to work in the virtual team, which come from different parts of the organization, like how do I get them yeah. to actually work on this part, which is kind of like a secondary job to their, their primary right. job? Yeah. Um, so the this only works if what you're trying to do is actually a really important thing for the company. So if, if it is well established and I do have some kind of like, um, what's the word like uh, credibility there that this is a really big problem that we have the way that we work with data as, as the example, um, then, I, then, then I should be able to find teams who have some spare capacity that, that could then work with me. It's of course not that easy because like you said, like, People have their own priorities and, and they think that they're very important and, and I'm sure that they always are. Um, so you wanna be a little bit targeted about how you choose which teams. And in the case of the golden path use cases, you're gonna probably gonna have a lot of different like options and uh, think about the different teams you could work with where those priorities line up as close as possible. So if some of those teams are not collecting data in a good way for, um, maybe not regard like not maybe not because of the platform but um just because they, they did it a long time ago and it's in its legacy and it's obsolete maybe i want to work with them right away because like they will get extra benefit from being the first user whereas another team maybe like they don't understand why it would be so important to them and, and similarly like if the team is an extra impactful team where they need where they could get where, where they do make a, a lot of use from insights uh, by, by helping them get, make those insights even easier to get, then probably they're going to see extra benefit there too. It's more difficult, a little bit more difficult with the side street users, but, or, or like those secondary users, but, uh, at least in our case, those are the users who are notoriously underserved by the platform that we build because we kind of have like left them on their own, especially when Spotify was a lot smaller in order to figure out how to do these things. So it's the same thing. Like they, they do are reasonably incentivized to work with us and get something that's nice, nicely supported. So find your supporters around underserved users and underserved needs. Yeah, yeah, um, and make sure that we can that we can give them incentives that are pretty good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, before we wrap up, we have one more question in the chat. So Yaroslav, if you don't mind, and Robert, if you have time, let's have mm -hmm. it answered. Uh, so uh, from uh, Marina. How do you balance between priorities set up by the upper management and priorities highlighted by the users? Yeah, so assuming that by users you mean the like the teams within the company, like the other teams within the company who need who uh, have like feature requests and stuff. This is a, a, a kind of a difficult um, act, like balancing act that we need to play. And the way that I look at it is we like we're expected to spend as much time as we can by with the, on these top down priorities. But the key thing there is as much time as we can. And uh, that means that we, we, we always have some budget to work on like what we call keep the lights on work. Um, and, and that basically my team will have full discretion on to, to decide what, what that might be. And it could be that the tech deck is bad, is, is so bad that we have like serious productivity problems and we got to work on that. Or like maybe we're causing incidents and losing data and, thing, and things like this. So like we could work on that kind of keep the lights on work, or it could be that the things that the users are interested in are really so important to the, our product being, being usable and do, achieving what it's supposed to achieve that it makes sense for me to prioritize that under the like a uh, category of keep the lights on as well. Because if what we build doesn't actually solve the problem because we, this thing that this very important user isn't there, then we just need to we just need to solve it ahead of whatever the next priority is. So it, it's all about, I guess, like evaluating and understanding what that the need is for that particular feature that a user might be asking for, and then deciding if it is important enough to be considered keep the lights on for our product. Uh, Marina said thanks. 
thank you very much uh, for all your answers and to, uh, for sharing your experience. Uh, uh, that was a gem and uh, I'm sure a lot of people found the uh, uh, techniques, hands-on techniques that they can uh, use in their everyday uh, job. Uh, so uh, the recording and the slides we will share by the end of the week uh, with all the participants. Um, and to see you next time on the next VM night. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening. See you. Thanks a lot, Robert. And we will also share the info that you are hiring product managers in Spotify. I think a lot of people will try to apply by your reference. So <laughs> thanks again for that. And uh, have a great, great day, great evening, and a great end of the week, all of you. And stay safe, guys. Bye-bye. Right. Take care. Bye.